Hello everyone. Uh, welcome back or welcome for the first time. Uh, I'm going to try and start a new video series largely focused on books but also on current issues, books which help us understand things that are going on in the world today right now. Um, so some of my old Facebook friends might remember last year I did a series called How to Appreciate a Book and uh, so we're going to move that into more current affairs with this new series I want to try and do. So books for our times, that's the uh, tentative name of the new video series and uh, today for the first uh, book I want to talk about uh, a little bit of news context and the news of course for many of us here in the US and I'm sure around the world uh, is Tulsi Gabbard and Tulsi as we have seen has been slowly building up support from a very diverse coalition of mostly progressive voices but also some conservative voices and there's a lot of independent activists, political analysts, you know, YouTubers, bloggers, ordinary people here in the US um, who are connecting with what she's saying. Of course there are a lot of similarities what, with what Bernie Sanders has been saying but then she's also her own person and uh, they're also beginning to understand and this is of particular relevance to those of us who are uh, Hindus in America and also uh, people in India uh, who are concerned about Hindu misrepresentation. Uh, many of uh, Tulsi's supporters, particularly in the US, are also starting to notice the question of Hindu phobia. You know, the fact that Tulsi uh, seems to be getting systematically misrepresented, smeared, and uh, so on and so forth. It started with smears about her uh, so called Hindu nationalism ties or associations. Uh, nothing more substantive than that and of late you know there's more more and more attacks on her uh, largely because of the very credible coherent and persistent or rather consistent uh, criticism she is mounting against uh, the bedrock of the american political economic ideological cultural media educational system and that is uh, you know the 50s concept the military industrial uh, complex. So Tulsi Gabbard, the news item on which I'm going to be talking about a book, um, has been excluded from the next democratic debate uh, on a very flimsy pretext that uh, some of the opinion polls on which uh, you know the Democratic Party apparently decides uh, who to allow on the stage to debate or not uh, are not considered, you know, uh, official. So there's a lot of polls in which, you know, Tulsi keeps getting around 2% or whatever is their criterion. Uh, but then the Democratic Party says, you know, we will only recognize two or three um, opinion polls. So it's on this very strange pretext that, um, you know, which is so bureaucratic in nature uh, that, you know, they've kept it out of the next debate, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, but what I wanted to talk about today, particularly for uh, Tulsi supporters here in the US um, who are aware of uh, the problem particularly with the media silencing that is going on uh, about Tulsi who are and also now this new dimension of using you know the the, the pretext of public opinion uh, as a way to kind of pretend that she's a fringe candidate or you know she doesn't have any support so Things can go on as usual with war candidate one and war candidate two uh, and three and four, etc. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to give us a little more depth into what is going on with the media, uh, I want to talk about a very interesting and important book today. And here it is. I'm working backward with the phone here, so hopefully. This is not appearing in mirror image. Okay, so Constructing Public Opinion by Justin Lewis. Justin Lewis is one of the most respected scholars in the field of media and cultural studies. And I had the honor to say he was my PhD guide and professor back in UMass. Um, and the other interesting thing was some of the research that he did for this book. Uh, I was his teaching assistant at the time, so actually 
uh, you know, can remember the times when these surveys were handed out and you know, all the things that happened in the 90s. So just a quick um, <clears throat> overview of the book and then I'll tell you some of the things about it which are very interesting and I'll urge you to read it as well. Um, so constructing a public opinion and the subtitle is so important. Okay? How political elites do what they like and why we seem to go along with it. Okay? How elites do what they like and why we seem to go along with it. Okay? So published by Columbia University Press, I think in 2000, 2001. Okay? So, um, so this is not a simple um, you know, summary of public opinion polls nor at the same time is it a too postmodern um, philosophical rambling, you know, saying that there's no such thing as the public man or something like that. No, it's something in between. It comes from somebody who is a rigorous and clear social scientific thinker, but at the same time who has enough of the philosophical depth of critical cultural studies and also a sensitivity to politics and to human issues. So... Uh, it's a very fascinating book, and now you know. Now that uh, uh, Tulsi and public opinion polls are so much in the news, I want to talk a little bit about it. So uh, the best way to get a sense of this book, you know, before we get into some of the very interesting survey questions we find on Clinton, on WMDs, and uh, you know what the American public believes it knows. So Justin's premise in this book, by the way, is very interesting. So um, you know he critiques the way public opinion is constructed in the media here in the U.S. and in U.S. politics. Uh, but he follows, it, follows this up with his own empirical research, survey research, where he surveys Americans not on public opinion, which is such a liquidy concept, but on public knowledge. You know, what is it that they think they know about American politics, about policies, uh, so on and so forth. And... The results, you know, whether it's about uh, the dog named Millie in the White House or President Clinton, um, are very, very revealing because this is the book that gives you the real scholarly evidence of how much of an influence the military industrial propaganda media system we live in in the U.S. has had in the last, you know, 20 years or so. You know, okay, so uh, very briefly. Uh, you know, just so that you understand a little bit about the book. So Justin begins by saying that, uh, you know, like many of us, he's fascinated by public opinion polls because we want to know what other people are thinking. And, you know, he talks about the whole discourse, um, uh, you know, around public opinion, you know, which, of course, these days is even more prevalent with the big news channels flashing tweets and, you know, uh, things like that. Uh, so he says he's always found opinion polls to be like ads. They're very catchy, they capture your attention, and they're also loud because they're screaming, they're saying, hey, look at me, I'm the public and I'm talking, and right now you see these numbers like, you know, Warren 20% or, um, you know, Kamala 10% or whatever, and uh, Tulsi, of course, these, they don't even dare put up her name, but another uh, story that. Um, so Justin says, uh, you know, that you know, ad, public opinion polls are like ads. They are loud but have no depth, um, you know, which is a very interesting take. So he approaches public opinion essentially as a cultural form. That's the phrase, you know, that he uses. So in this book, you know, he talks uh, quite a bit about the history of how public opinion came to be, you know, a thing in the U.S. public discourse uh, going back all the way to the early 20th century. But where this book is, you know, incredibly useful is in mapping out the process by which the media captured the American mind and American politics uh, in the 1990s, the post-Cold War period, which was a time when many uh, progressives believed that with the end of the Cold War, you know, that all that money that was being spent uh, on wars around the world could be diverted, you know, to more um, useful causes. Uh, so, to put it in slightly more academic terms, this book is a study, it's like a social history of the process of hegemony in the U.S. in the 90s. How is it that um, a process of 
um, how did the process of capturing consent for the same old, same old play out? To, so to put it in very simple terms, uh, the phrase uh, that I kind of came up with as I reread this book is I think what happened in the 90s, particularly with the Democratic Party and uh, President Clinton, and what we see happening now as well, you know, with the sort of the hard, hard conviction progressives like Tulsi versus, you know, the kind of nominal uh, liberal position uh, politicians. I think what happened starting in the 90s is a politics in America, which I would characterize as talking left, but rigging right. Okay? Talking left, rigging right. So what I mean by that is that um, the power structure, the economic structure, the military, industrial business, the media business, the blood uh, warriors, I've wanted to say some other word, but it might be too impolite for my first broadcast. So the blood warriors, CNN, you know, which made its money and mark with the Gulf War, all these people, you know, dug in and made this military, military industrial war machine uh, business model, the, you know, a lot deeper, you know, starting in the 90s. But what they also started doing, and this is where the media role comes in, which I'm interested in as a media observer, is that they started talking left. So in a sense, the talk shifted, you know, from the old, uh, you know, patriotic, uh, America is right stuff. And of course, there was a little bit of that during the Gulf War as well, you know, on Fox News and everything. It started to shift from that where to a different position where, you know, you had Democrats, you had so-called liberals who were talking peace, who were talking humanitarianism, uh, but they were playing the same rigged system, which was still taking Americans into war, which was still destroying, you know, uh, villages around the world. Uh, and most importantly for us, you know, as, as citizens and as media, media consumers, you know, lying to us and lying to us with so much desperation. Just think of the last two months, the smear campaigns on Tulsi, then the, I mean, the digital morphing where they put a pimple on Tulsi's face in one of the debates. I mean, uh, find, find it very hard to believe. Uh, but anyway, so this book, uh, you know, gives us some uh, very key insights into things that happened since the 90s. So I'll share a few of them with you. So uh, Justin starts in, with uh, a survey that he did in, in the early 90s, you know, around the time of the first Gulf War. And the context for that, you know, is very interesting. So uh, he starts with a uh, very interesting phrase. I'll just write it and show it here. He says, just after the Cold War ended and the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a lot of talk about something called, well, I hope you can see this. Okay, I'll figure out my optics better next time. Peace dividend, okay? So, in 1989, he says, there were 58 references, okay, in uh, the media to this phrase, the peace dividend. Then by 1990, this grew to 589 references. Okay. So what peace dividends means basically is this idea that now that the Cold War was over, all that money being spent on the U.S. defense, which was so huge, could be spent on education, on uh, poverty alleviation, uh, you know, other things, you know, which were good for people and not just the defense contractors and war machine. So he says, you know, from the time the Soviet Union collapsed, 89 to 90, you know, this concept was around. It was in the conversation in the American media. And then he says, by 1997, it was down to, 47. Okay. So what an interesting, um, you know, indicator he uses, you know, a phrase, an idea for peace called peace dividend, which is being floated around. People are talking about it in the media. It starts to gain momentum uh, till 1990. And then, of course, suddenly we have this whole Iraq war and George Bush and um, CNN making a spectacle out of it. And by the end of the decade, that idea starts is almost gone you know, from the public discourse. So what is happening instead? 
you know, and this is the story which gets very, very um, interesting. Um, <clears throat> So Justin starts to look at how the media began to capture public thinking and public opinion uh, and steer it towards essentially a support for the status quo, you know, a support for the military industrial political system. And uh, his premise is very interesting and this connects to what I mentioned earlier about why he did a public knowledge survey and not just a public opinion survey. Okay, So his premise essentially is that you know, what we call public opinion, regardless of how well a pollster measures it or not, uh, what we call public opinion really is based on, you know, not just knowledge, there may be some knowledge, but a lot of beliefs and assumptions. So he manages to show us in this book that uh, Americans' public opinions are based on a very, very uh, limited or skewed set of information about the world, about their own politics, about world affairs, etc. And the reason for that is the media environment, you know. Um, you know, it's reminding me of, uh, you know, one of these surveys that, uh, um, uh, you know, people were talking about, Tulsi supporters were talking about, where Tulsi's name wasn't even on the opinion poll, and then they conduct the poll, and then later they say, oh yeah, nobody's, you know, Tulsi didn't figure, you know. So, anyway... <laughs> Uh, so back to 1992. So Justin says that you know even as this post Cold War peace dividend talking uh, talk was increasing, the media began to <coughs> excuse me, uh, sorry, steer the conversation uh, in such a way that people, be, you know, would be convinced that there was still a need for a huge military. There was still a need for wars. Uh, even though the Soviet Union had collapsed, etc. So, um, in 1990, apparently the LA Times, uh, not a fan of it, but anyway, so there's a, a, a poll they did in 1990 about where they asked people, uh, under what reasons would you support uh, you know, a, a U.S. intervention, okay, because intervention, ending intervention is a big part of, you know, Tulsi's uh, uh, promise. I wanted to mention this. So, uh, 1990, LA Times does this poll, and uh, <clears throat> all right, so um, So they asked the people, you know, would you support the U.S. going to war, that is, uh, doing an intervention, uh, if it would mean that the price of gas would come down, uh, or if it would secure oil resources, and the third, punish foreign aggression. So here's the interesting thing. 61% uh, of the people said, no, it's not, we should, the U.S. shouldn't go to war just to secure oil. And when they put it more directly about gas prices, 91% of people said, no, that's horrible. I mean, why should we go to war uh, just so that our you know, gas prices can stay low? Now, here's the interesting thing. But when they asked, should the U.S. go to war to punish a government or a country which has been aggressive with a neighbor? You know, like they claimed, uh, I don't know, I guess they said that about Iraq and Kuwait. Uh, and that number drops to 37 percent. Okay, so in other words, uh, you know, the media were figuring out how to manage public opinion, and they pretty much figured out, I guess, by the early 90s, that uh, you know the way to do it was to uh, sell the public on these so-called humanitarian interventions. You know, like he's uh, so-and-so is a dictator, he's attacked his neighbor, so-and-so is a dictator, he's gassing his own people. Uh, how could you do that? I mean, so they were just building up this hysteria because they realized that, you know, this was the public. You know, the American public actually, you know, Justin says in this book, you know, is fairly liberal, left of center, um, and decent, you know, if you were to really let them speak, which is why I still have hope about Tulsi and, I guess, Bernie too. Um, <clears throat> 
So when people are asked, would you support a war to reduce your oil prices? 90% say no, never. Uh, but when they say, would you support a war to punish a dictator like Saddam Hussein? More people are willing to say yes. So, um, so in this context, you know, Justin did several surveys throughout the 1990s. And uh, some of these findings are very, very interesting. I'll share uh, a couple of them. Uh, one of the questions Justin asked in, in his survey was, you know, which of the following areas, uh, defense or war, welfare, uh, or uh, foreign aid? Okay, so if you looked at the U.S. budget each year, which of these three areas, defense, welfare, <coughs> excuse me, foreign aid, does the U.S. government spend the most money on? I mean, in other words, where does your most of your tax dollar go? And here's a very interesting thing. So this was early 90s. I'm sure things are better now. Seventy-two percent of people thought. Seventy-two percent of people thought that the U.S. government spends more money on welfare and on foreign aid for poor, poor people than on its defense, on its military budget. Okay. So right there we have evidence of how profoundly uh, misinformed the American public was you know, at that time because there's so much talk even, uh, if I recall correctly, even the Clinton campaign was doing this welfare reform talk and all that, that people just assume that you know, the big, big uh, <clears throat> you know, burden on the American taxpayer is not the war machine, it's not these wars, but uh, the poor, uh, you know, Americans and, uh, you know, the poor people on foreign aid, you know. Anyway, the fact is, both, you know, this is a very, very minuscule part of the budget. Um, and then throughout the 90s, you know, uh, Justin did several studies, but there's, uh, and of course, it's very clear that that so-called support that the American public was offering to the Iraq war and everything was based on several incorrect assumptions which came from systematic media, uh, you know, uh, propaganda and cover-ups. And a very interesting fact he mentions, you know, again, in terms of how the media systematically has, you know, silenced dissent and diversity of debate. Um, he quotes another study where they looked at the sources cited in the big news channels, ABC, CBS, etc. And what they found is that 79% of the news items on the Iraq war in the big five uh, news uh, sources came from either the State Department, White House, or the Pentagon. Okay, so in other words, they were rarely initiating stories that came, say, from uh, people on the ground in Iraq or from anti-war activists or from dissidents, or I suppose dissident politicians. So you can see how, you know, the media was systematically excluding other voices creating this false impression of widespread public support for a war uh, and, you know, all these things that were happening in the 90s. So finally, now the last two, three minutes, I want to bring this back to politics, particularly the Democratic Party, because many of us in the U.S., you know, tend to think of it as a party that's somewhat pro-peace, pro-poor, liberal, etc. Now, uh, Justin, in a sense, was uh, prescient about it, I think, in a sense, he... Uh, beat the band Rage Against the Machine and their great videos to recognizing that uh, something was going awfully wrong in the Democratic Party in the 90s itself. Uh, so in one of the studies that he did in 1992, he asked the question and, uh, you know, of his uh, respondents, uh, who do you think gives more money to the Democratic Party, big business or labor? Who do you get, think gives more money to the Republicans, big business or labor? Now, Republicans, everyone comfortably guessed. They said, oh, yeah, it's big business for sure, which is, you know, true. But when they were asked a question about Democrats, here's the interesting thing. Most people just assumed that the Democratic Party is funded by labor unions more than business corporations. Okay? So, again, you know, great example 
of you know the sort of the mythic public opinion that was being created by our propaganda system. Now, the next survey that Justin did, which is also discussed in this book, was in 1998, and this is about President Clinton, because the Clinton legacy seems to be such a big part of uh, things that are going on even today with Tulsi and everything. So I wanted to share that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in the 1998 survey, um, Justin asked, uh, you know, one of the questions he asked the participants is, do you think that Bill Clinton's policies put him on the liberal side or the conservative side of the uh, Democratic Party? And about 51% said liberal side. Okay? And uh, don't have the exact number, but in a much, much smaller number, uh, you know, said, said or thought that Clinton actually had conservative policies. And this is very interesting because when you look at the rest of the questions, I won't reveal all of them because you know, I think you'll have more fun getting this book and reading it. Uh, I'll share a link, uh, Amazon link uh, on, on the page. One of the questions they ask, uh, Justin asked, was about military spending. Okay? And uh, they kind of, he, the survey questionnaire asked people, so has Bill Clinton reduced military spending or has he increased it? What, what, what is his stand on military spending? And 67% assume that Clinton wants to reduce military spending because, you know, they just assume he's a liberal, he's against war. And it's also very interesting. Some of the other questions on the survey are all about Monica Lewinsky and things like that, you know. And People know all the names, you know, those, those facts, uh, Americans know very well. They know the name of the person who, uh, in that scandal, they know the name of the prosecutor. And another very interesting fact, you know, 90% of people know, knew that George Bush's dog was named Millie. Okay? So all these kind of uh, trivial uh, sound bites that the media has been circulating, they know all that. Okay? So what they don't know is what is actually going on what are the policies what are the issues so they assume that clinton was anti-war another question was on the land mine ban uh, <coughs> excuse me justin asked are they uh, does clinton favor the ban on land mines or you know does he oppose it and uh, 44 percent just guessed and said yeah yeah of course clinton must be against land mines you know he's a liberal you know, saxophone hippie or whatever. So again, you see all this guesswork, this mythology that the audience is operating on about uh, the, the liberal Clinton, you know, uh, as opposed to the actual policy, uh, political Clinton. Uh, so there's a lot of, um, you know, interesting <clears throat> facts like this in uh, uh, constructing public opinion. All the three surveys, uh, the Gulf War study, the Clinton study, they're all in there. Uh, um, so anyway, so I wanted to share this book uh, because I think it's a very useful book for us to read, to recognize that there's a lot of scholarship and research, well, maybe not a lot, but at least some very um, solid work that has been done on an issue that is playing out in a very, very profound way right now. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll read this book and I will come back with some more uh, books and ideas on current affairs and uh, keep the conversation going. Thank you.